We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. Dr. Daniel McClellan, am I pronouncing this correctly? Yes, sir. Hey, thank you for joining me here at Myth Vision. It's been a long time coming. Hey, thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it. I appreciate your time. Appreciate your time and the time of everybody watching. I, uh, I hope they enjoy it. I know that many of my audience will enjoy this. I don't see why not all of them would, but I could if some of them maybe are approaching this from maybe a fundamentalist angle, why this could be <laughs> troubling. <laughs> um, if I may introduce you, Dan McClellan is a scripture translation supervisor for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He received his PhD from the University of Exeter. He specializes in the Hebrew Bible and early Israel, and his research focuses on conceptualizations of deity, scripture, and religious identity particularly through the methodological lenses of cognitive linguistics and the cognitive science of religion. He also works to combat misinformation, as do I, and democratize access to the academic study of the Bible and religion online. And if you want to look for his handles, if you will, um, they are in the description. He has TikTok, he has Twitter, he has Instagram, and those are like the main social medias, I guess, that you would plug. You are on Facebook as well, but um, those are the top three. Welcome. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. Uh, your book, how long ago was it this book came out? Uh, last week. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm very uh, uh, privileged here to have you sitting here talking about it, actually. And I appreciate you giving me your time to do this. Why did you write this book, if I may ask? So this was uh, based on a doctoral dissertation that I wrote uh, under uh, Professor Francesca Stavrikopoulou through the University of Exeter. And I had, uh, I had been working on research related to monotheism, the conceptualization of deity, particularly through the lens of cognitive linguistics for a while. I wrote a master's thesis on a related topic at Trinity Western University, just outside of Vancouver, um, back in... Ooh, when did I complete that? I think 2012 or 2013. Um, <clears throat> and these were just topics that I've been very interested in for a long time. And as I, as I was, uh, I started my first, my master's thesis with the goal of writing on monotheism. And when monotheism started, did it start? Is there monotheism in the Bible? Uh, and as I got going into it, I kept coming back to this question that I could not find an answer I was satisfied with, which was, what is a deity? And I felt like if we can't nail this down, if we can't draw lines around that category, then we can't, you know, it's harder to tell when this all started. And uh, I started looking into cognitive linguistics because there were some theories related to how we intuitively conceptualize categories. And the more I dug into it, the more I realized how helpful it was because cognitive linguistics was addressing, you know, how we see the world, not just how we rationalize the world or how we reason about it, but how our minds um, shape the world uh, for us. And I, I realized that it's a lot more complex than the way scholars have been talking about it. We like to try to define things. We like things that are uh, that have binaries and dichotomies. And we can mm -hmm. say this is all yes or all no. It's black and white. Um, and when we can do that, we can draw boundaries. And then we can say it stops here, it starts here, very clean lines. And that's not how our minds arrange the world in our perception. Yeah, you spend quite a time in your introduction in the first chapter. Obviously, I haven't read the whole thing, which is why I'm going to ask politely if we can possibly do more, because I'm already loving what I'm chewing on in this book. For those who are interested in the book, in paperback or hardcover, co um, you can get it on Amazon. I will say this. If you can risk reading ebook, you can get it for free. The link is in the description right now. Let's get some attention out there. He was a student of Francesca Stavrakopoulou's uh, work. So like her book, God and Anatomy, it's going to have some overlap in some way, shape or form. You may not agree on everything, but at the end of the day, I, I don't know a single student who doesn't try to challenge their professor and take a different approach. So that makes you, you know, what you're supposed to be, uh, someone who's writing a dissertation, which is going to be unique in your approach. I, I did want to just show the handles here and to let everybody know if they're interested, help support us here at Myth Vision's uh, Patreon. 
I am starting to pump out content and get stuff that is not out there on YouTube, early access for those who help join and you're helping the community. There's also buried deep into this Patreon, well over 100, 150 videos that have never been made public on YouTube. So you're accessing exclusive content and you're helping us grow. There's also a course we just launched just a couple days ago on the ancient Greek mysteries with M. David Litwa. And in this course, we go into everything from on Isis, Osiris, uh, Perse uh, Persephone, um, you name it, Dionysus. And then we finally end up at Jesus. There's like four other um, deities in which these mysteries are there. But check them out. Uh, join them. And then there are a lot of courses in the link in the description as well with Bart Ehrman that I've done in the past. So if you haven't seen some of those, highly recommend checking them out. All right. I really want to focus on some stuff with you, Daniel, because um, you, when we, when we started wanting to get into this book, you gave me some images and I said, maybe it's good if you, and you told me to call you Dan, just so everybody knows I'm not being rude. You were going to present something like take us through the book in some way with your little presentation in some form. We don't have like PowerPoints or anything, but right. take us through that. And then we'll take super chats at the end Q and a, anybody have any questions? We can go from there. Great. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned that in that master's thesis, I was working with cognitive linguistics. And one of the things that I looked at was something called uh, prototype theory, which is basically the notion that our grasp of the concepts that we learn throughout our lives uh, don't boil down to necessary and sufficient features, which is the foundation of, of definition. Uh, what, when we look something up in the dictionary, we're looking at uh, a sentence or a phrase or something like that that has been distilled down by looking at all the members of a category and trying to find whatever features all of those members of that category have in common that no other categories have. And so um, if you can distill it all down to that short list of features that are necessary for inclusion and sufficient for distinction from all other categories, then you can define uh, that category. And that basically means you can draw lines around it. You can create a boundary. You can say everything inside this is a part of this category. And this is based on uh, Aristotelian kind of taxonomy. And it's a lot how we have created our understanding of language, our understanding of uh, biology, of nature, of everything since the enlightenment. Um, but that's not how our brains work. Our brains develop categories based on similarities to prototypes. And the prototypes that our brains develop uh, come from our experiences with categories. Uh, and so uh, an example that I generally use is uh, our experiences are going to differ from time to time, place to place, person to person. And so our understanding of categories is going to differ. And I usually start out with two categories. The first one is a boot. If you ask somebody on the street in San Antonio to describe a boot in as much detail as possible, they're going to describe a cowboy boot because that's what they have seen identified as a boot far more than any other type of boot. But if you do the same thing with someone on the streets in Liverpool, they're either going to describe an army boot or the trunk of a car because they have much different experiences with the words. So the categories that we carry around in our minds are not universal. They're not all identical. They depend on our experiences. And the other category that I like to use is furniture. Most of us probably feel pretty confident we can distinguish furniture from not furniture. But I have I've, I ask people this all the time in doing presentations and lectures and things like that. Tell me what the necessary and sufficient features of furniture are. No one carries around a list of the necessary and sufficient features of furniture. And we certainly don't go around and go, should I call this furniture? Well, let's see. Does it have A, B, and C? Okay, it's furniture. Yes, I call that furniture. Nobody does that because our minds are already taking care of that. Um, everything we have seen called furniture our minds have kind of um, logged away and we've created this ideal, this, this cognitive exemplar of furniture. And so we just perceive it to be similar enough that we can call it furniture. And so this is how we develop our categories. And these don't come with boundaries. Um, and uh, Wittgenstein noticed this almost 100 years ago. He said, um, how do you, uh, can you define a game, uh, the word game? Can you draw a boundary around it? No, because no one ever has before, but that never bothered you when you use the word 
before. And so boundaries tend to be drawn when a rhetorical need for them arises. What is a woman? You know, we're going to draw the boundary in a way that serves whatever our rhetorical goals are. I want that to not be a woman, so I have to create a boundary over here. I want that to be a woman, so I've got to create a boundary over here. And we do that for what is a sandwich, is a, is cereal soup, um, racism, sexism, is uh, power uh, asymmetry necessary to have racism, or is it just uh, purely racial discrimination? So we do this for so many different things in life. And scholars do it for things like deity. And uh, we want to draw boundaries somewhere, and usually it's to serve whatever our rhetorical goals are. So in, in the book, what I start off uh, with is saying, we're going to examine deity along with agency and personhood. And we're going to try to find out how intuitively we conceptualize these things. Um, and then from there, put together, develop this theoretical framework for what deity is, what divine agency is, and then how divine images work. Um, and one of There's the big so things- so many layers to this, by the way. Yeah, so, yeah. This is, yeah. This is why my, <laughs> I had the hardest time putting it together an elevator pitch for this, uh, <laughs> because I was like, we need about 45 minutes. Um, but uh, there's a good uh, illustration of uh, one of the main principles that I draw from, and it's uh, called, um, there are a bunch of different words for it, but dual process cognition is probably the, uh, the most common one. And this is the, the notion that we have a, uh, our cognition operates on a spectrum that runs from intuitive cognition, which is subconscious, it's rapid, it's automatic, it's outside of our control. We frequently don't even know what's going mm -hmm. on. And that runs all the way into our reflective cognition, which is slower, it's intentional, it's what we control, it's based on reason, logic, evidence, authority, fear, identity politics, things like that. Um, and so sometimes these two ends of our cognition can conflict and our reflective cognition will come in to overrule our intuitive or will come in to uh, bolster our intuitive, whether it's right or wrong. Uh, and can you pull up that image, the, um, the illustration of the two objects that look like they're in a, on a field in space? Oh, uh, is it uh, this here? Uh, yeah, yeah. So this is, this is my illustration that I like to use in presentations on this. So this looks like a dark object on, above a light object. But on your screen, if you use your fingers and cover up the shaded and highlighted part in the center, you should see that <laughs> bo both objects are actually the exact same color gray. Now, for some people, it may take more than covering up in the center. You may need to cover up the shadows or the highlights on the edges as well. But this is something that is fooling your intuitive cognition because we've spent all of our lives overwhelmingly experiencing light sources coming from above. And so when we see this thing that makes our intuitive cognition think, oh, this is a physical object in space. That's the ground. That's the sky. Um, we've got a light source coming from uh, the upper left. And so our brains anticipate that the object on top is going to be lighter in color because it is in the sunshine, while the object on the bottom should be darker because it's in the shade. They're the same shade. They're the exact same color gray. And so our brains actually have us perceive them as different colors because the input does not compute with what our experiences have told us the world around us is like. Mm. And so our brains are then giving to our reflective cognition, telling us you're going to experience this in a totally different way. And what this illustrates is that all of our, our perception, all of our senses and all of our cognition is mediated by our intuitive cognition. We don't directly experience the world. We are shown the world by our intuitive cognition. And it has a bunch of expectations and default settings, and a lot of them are wrong. And so what we experience is what evolution has decided is most um, conducive to our survival, even if it's wrong. Um, and so this has some side effects. And this is where we get into the, the roots of the, the whole concept of religion. 
Um, one of the most important things to surviving infancy is other people, is other humans. We rely on them for years. They are the, without other humans, we do not survive. And so evolutionarily, we have developed this dependency on humans. And one of the most important parts of the humans that research has suggested we even can recognize before birth is the human face. Uh, they've they've shown um, lights through the uterine wall onto um, fetuses before they're born, and they and they um, track movement and how they respond. And if they have three dots that look like uh, uh, two eyes and a nose or a mouth or something like that, um, there is more of uh, what they call an attentional bias. The fetus pays attention to it, is is oriented toward it. But if they show the same thing upside down, there's less attentional bias. So. Scholars think that this is something that is innate, that we are born with this bias towards um, a human face. And so we have this sensitivity to agency in the world around us. And another way this pops up is in uh, our sensitivity to the presence of agents in the world around us that might be focused on us, that might do us harm, which is why uh, you know, if we maybe sometimes we turn off the light in the basement and we get up the stairs a little quicker um, because we get this just this sensation that there's something down in the darkness or something like that. Or it's why scary movies make us feel like there's a presence out there or something like that. You talk well, about the rough, the ruffle in the bush or, you know, the analogy of surviving. And I like right. that analogy. I even heard just to throw this out there at you is that I heard that uh, some some evolutionary biologist or people who obviously are proponents of this would say the reason we're always thinking there's something in the closet or under the bed is because if you go back millions of years and for the millions of years we dwelt in the canopy of trees all of our enemies that were out to get us were beneath us when we slept so there seems to be a subconscious or built-in mechanism like you're describing evolutionarily on why we fear things in the dark or underneath us is because there were real predators for millions of years trying to kill our ancestors I just, yeah you know and so it's for it's, it's very interesting there's a there's a book um called faces in the clouds from 1990 um stuart guthrie talks um, about the the origin of this feature where, you know, millions and millions of years ago, before humans were a distinct species, the primate that more rapidly determined that the rustling in the bushes was something with, with teeth and, uh, you know, claws that might be focused on them rather than just the wind uh, was more likely to survive long enough to pass on their genes. And so there's a, the cost of false negatives is phenomenally high. Yeah, there's, uh, that, that's a, a very, um, you know, the, the word is kind of played, but a seminal publication in, in the field of uh, the cognitive science of religion. But the, the cost of a, a false um, positive is not very high. You know, maybe you get made fun of. Cost of a false positive, death. So right. there's no real ceiling for the sensitivity that our minds developed. And so our minds went crazy with our imagination. And uh, that's uh, scientists call this our hyperactive agency detection, our ability to detect agency in the world around us. This is why people see anthropomorphic figures and photographs of Mars. It's why scary movies make us feel there are people out there. It's why we see things out of the corner of our eye and, and want to know what's going on. We have the sensitivity and um, a lot of this is based on the feeling, the sensation of presence that we get when we interact with other people. And in the book, I talk about, I, I kind of start moving toward the concept of deity by talking about um, death. One of the things that our brains don't do is when a, a loved one passes away, passes on, our brains don't just switch off that feature where a smell, uh, a sound, an object, uh, clothing, triggered that sense of that individual's presence. Our brains aren't just like, okay, we're done with that and, and turn off. It, our brains will continue to um, make us feel that presence even after they're gone with certain triggers, certain cues. And so throughout the history of humanity, people have sensed the presence of deceased kin, deceased loved ones. And this has led to uh, all kinds of traditions and pretty much every society for which we have any data. 
that there are unseen agents in the world around us, whether they're spirits or ghosts or um, deities or however they're labeled, every society has some tradition of some kind of agent that we don't see in the world around us. And a lot of that is rooted in deceased kin, but there are other mechanisms that can that can cause the development of these traditions. You talk um, about just one example in your book, because I know you can't have your whole book memorized. Is <laughs> the no. animal that, you know, they witness an animal's foot on the edge of a cliff cause a rock to fall. And then you start automatically, like we talk about that immediate process that is subconscious. It, it, and it also is like assuming agency where there isn't any because now a massive boulder moves. Something did it because I remember the animal with the small little rocks that came down the hill and all my previous experiences with this kind of analogy in my life of seeing an animal do it, therefore agency on the bigger scale. And like the book you point out, making images in the clouds, I can't imagine how long humans in our world of ob observing the natural phenomena around us, how often, you know, how far back, just imagining – were we looking up at the clouds and seeing the things we see on earth? We did yeah. this with the heavens too. And we would try to mimic uh, celestial bodies and all of that. But anyway. Yeah. And, and tie together stars and say, see, that's Orion. And, um, <laughs> there's a, in that book, the Guthrie's book, he talks about um, how um, anthrop well, not anthropologists, but uh, primatologists have observed chimpanzees, it, when there's like a, a storm and thunder and lightning or something like that, they'll, some of them will like climb up on a branch of a tree and do this elaborate, like performing anger at whatever's going on, shake branches and leaves and throw stuff at in the direction of the sound and then turn around and, and leave. And um, so the, the perception that there's some agency behind that is even observable in, um, in primates to this day. So yeah, it's it's very deeply rooted, and and this is why some animals develop defense mechanisms, camouflage, where you know you have butterflies that have patterns that look like eyes, because eyes are are um, you know two of the main cues for presence, agency, and and things like that. Um, and so one of the things that we see in ancient treatment of the deceased is. Uh, this perception that they continue on in some way, shape, or form. And this is why burial assemblages begin to um, have the inclusion of things that seem to be dedicated to the use of the deceased, whether it's lamps that were never lit or food, or sometimes you will have a, a mortuary chapel where food is delivered, you know, every year or something like that. And this seems to reflect this perception that the deceased live on in some way. Um, and this leads to uh, cultic interactions with the deceased. You have some kind of relationship that you have. You're continuing this relationship with the deceased in some way. And so I wanted to bring up that other, uh, another image. Um, the one of the steely with the image of the person sitting on the throne and there's an inscription. Make sure I got this here. Yeah, there we go. So this is a stele of Katamua. This was um, from Zincirli in the um, southeast Anatolia. And this inscription talks about uh, this individual Katamua who had this commission when he was still alive and he's dead. And this was set up in his mortuary chapel. And the inscription talks about offerings that are to be made. And then um, on the line just above the bowl he's holding, it says... Um, to his soul, it's um, nefesh is what it would be in Hebrew, that is in this stele. And so this seems to reflect the idea that this stele was set up as a way to channel, transmit, house this unseen agency, the, the um, presence of this deceased individual, Katumua. And this is a very famous um Steely that was discovered, I think, in 2008 or 2009. <clears throat> but this leads me into talking a little bit more about uh, deity. From a uh, from an intuitive point of view, the I, I mentioned that when someone dies, our brain doesn't just turn off the perception of their presence, and so we tend to distinguish somebody's self from their body. Uh, that the detection of the perception of agency doesn't necessarily require a body, which is one of the reasons that horror movies with, you know, ghosts and spirits and, and kind of 
shapeless fogs and things like that uh, creep us out so much. Um, it's or tapping shadows. Into, yeah. yeah, shadows. And just um, we perceive that there's, uh, you know, it's easier to see if there's some kind of representation of, of their presence, but uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a body. Um, but it's a little nicer for us to interact with if there is some kind of material media that is um, representing them, indexing them. And so I bring up uh, in presentations, I'll usually show that Katamua Steely and say, so they, they understood his soul or however you want to label that to inhabit that Steely. And so they could go visit the mortuary chapel and bring it food and commune with their deceased loved one. And then I usually will show a picture of a headstone from a cemetery from today. I was just thinking about that. Yeah. And people go talk to headstones as if they're talking to their deceased loved one. And, you know, if you went up to somebody and said, why are you doing that? You know, they would have a hard time giving you a <laughs> rational explanation, but it is in, an intuitive thing to do when you associate that headstone with that individual, their presence, their self, if it's got their name on it or something like that, if it is an index for their presence, it's just intuitive to use that as kind of a, a physical index for someone we don't see out there. And so the logic of the Katumua stila is very little different from the logic of speaking to the headstone of a deceased loved one. With, and both of them are very little different from the logic of divine images because it was, uh, and now you can pull up the, um, can you pull up that image of the Holy of Holies with the incense altars and the, and the standing stone? This one, or is it the nope. Holy of Holies? The, yeah, there we go with a rod. So this is the Holy of Holies of the Judahite temple at a rod. And you've got the incense altars in, in the back corner. That's, you know, that's, very little different from Katamua's stele, from a headstone we might see in a cemetery today. That was Adonai's standing stone, divine image, that was probably in use up until right around the year 700 BCE. And it probably had um, Adonai's name painted on it at some point, if not inscribed in plaster or something like that. And the logic is no different, that this is an unseen agent who exists out there somewhere. And... This stone is a physical material index for that presence. And so uh, we can go be in the presence of God by uh, viewing this, uh, this stele. And uh, so that gets us into the question of deity uh, in the Hebrew Bible. And I have kind of three parts to my book. The first part is where I go into the cognitive science. What is deity? What is agency? What is personhood? And then I move into deity in the Hebrew Bible, where I apply um, prototype theory to the Bible's representation of deity to talk about all the different things that deity represents. And I kind of boil it down to um, some features that are not necessarily essential, but they're prototypical features of deity. One is uh, what cognitive scientists call full access to strategic information. In other words, a deity should be able to give you whatever information you need to make decisions about actions, about um, positions, perspectives, things like that. And we find that in the Hebrew Bible all over the place. Adonai is, you know, you seek out the deity to decide, are we going to war with the Philistines? Uh, where do I need to go to find water? All that kind of stuff. Another prototypical feature of deity, according to the cognitive science of religion, is uh, immortality, relative immortality. Deities live if not forever, at least much, much, much longer than, um, than regular humans. And we find that all over the Hebrew Bible. And uh, the other is the ability to monitor and punish. And this is an interesting feature of deity that is particularly prevalent in larger societies, because one of the th reasons that deity concepts persevere is because they are useful for large societies, because an unseen agent that monitors behavior mm -hmm and can punish bad behavior becomes a very handy kind of police force to keep people in line. And that helps people to um, stay in line. And that promotes what they call pro-sociality uh, or the behaviors that help a social group stay cohesive. So you don't get a lot of free riders and a lot of folks who are violating social mores. Everybody kind of stays in line. And if you've got your police force that could be anywhere and can see anything, 
and knows everybody's behavior, even down to their thoughts, that becomes a very effective um, police force. And we see this in the Hebrew Bible as well. And so all of the things that the cognitive science of religion has suggested are kind of foundational to the development of deity concepts are central to the conceptualization of Adonai and of deity in the Hebrew Bible. And then uh, I, I start with generic concepts of deity, how that's reflected in the Hebrew Bible, and then go to show that Adonai, uh, the God of Israel, is not this revolutionary different deity, totally unlike all other deities in the Hebrew Bible, but is the same as all the other deities in the Hebrew Bible and differs only in incremental elaborations that um, accretes to the deity's profile over time as new authors assert new features to respond to uh, certain circumstances. And that brings us into um, Adonai's divine images. Uh, the idols, the divine images that were used that are found in the Hebrew Bible for Adonai and how they change over time as these authoritative writers are responding to circumstances. And so I start with the Ark of the Covenant, which in form and function very closely matches a shrine model or a miniature model of a temple. And now if you could pull up the, the drawing of the two little boxes. Uh, yeah, so these are a couple of shrine models that I believe were discovered at um, Kiafa by Garfinkel and, and um, others. And the, these are examples of shrine models. So it looks like a temple. You have these recessed uh, door frames that are supposed to represent the progression through the different rooms of the temple. And then at the top, you have little representations of what look like roof beams. And in the middle, you would, inside this object, you would place a miniature divine image, whether it would be a bull or um, a, a goddess figurine or whatever your divine images that you use would be placed in the center. And in this way, you miniaturize, you mobilize, and you democratize that divine agency that is made available through that divine image. And now so these are real a, images of actual, I mean, you paint, you drew these, but yes, I, these are actual yeah. images of a real, um, artifact here. And in this would mm -hmm. have housed an image of God or a God. Yeah, some kind of divine image. And there's another drawing. I don't think I sent it along, but there's a there's a large one that looks like a um, a jar, similar to the jars that were discovered at uh, at Qumran, the Dead Sea Scroll jars. But there's a little door, and in the same area there was a little uh, bull calf that was discovered that fits right in there. And so that would have been an example mm -hmm. of one of the divine images that would go inside there. Um, and so the Ark of the Covenant in form and function matches what's going on here. Be and we found some shrine models that look very close to a box that have cherubim on them and, and things like that. Um, now, the only difference is it's supposed to be made of wood. It's supposed to be carried around on these sticks. And, and this is actually, these are features of uh, a very similar thing uh, called a, a bark that was used in Egypt, which basically served the same function. The, the divine image went inside and you just carried it around on their little wooden boat. Um, and so I started looking at the standing stone that we see in the Holy of Holies at Arad and thinking, there you go. So that would have had the divine name written on it. And that would have been what commissioned, so to speak, this object to presence the deity or reify manifest the presence of the deity and if the ark of the covenant is a shrine model we would expect a miniature divine image to be housed within the ark of the covenant but what went inside the ark of the covenant little miniature standing stones that had the law written on them but what's the the first few words of the law anohi adonai elohecha I am Adonai, your God. In other words, it would also have God's name written on it. So um, I, I argue in the book that we should probably look into whether or not these tablets of the law were miniature stelae or standing stones and were placed in the Ark of the Covenant as a shrine model. In other words, this would have made portable, um, made 
uh, available uh, to a bunch of people, uh, God's presence. And then we have some other things that are placed in the ark as well. Uh, for instance, the uh, Aaron's rod that's supposed to have budded. Uh, there's a scholar, uh, Ranan Eichler, a couple of years ago published a, a paper saying, man, that sounds an awful lot like an Asherah or an Asherah pole, you know, which was this uh, representation of a tree that, uh, you know, was also put in the Ark of the Covenant. So that sounds an awful lot like a miniaturized divine image also put in the Ark of the Covenant for Asherah. Um, and so that's that's a great article from uh, a journal called Vedas Testamentum uh, that that talks about the possibility of that. And then we've got Nehushtan, this uh, this bronze serpent. Serpents were uh, sometimes used as divine images for deities as well. And the the Asherah, the bronze serpent, these were supposed to have been taken out by Hezekiah, by Josiah, and destroyed, but they were in the uh, the Holy of Holies in the Jerusalem temple. So these seem to be early divine images um, for Adonai, perhaps for Asherah, perhaps for other deities that were represented through serpents and things like that. Um, but as, an odd thing happens once you get down to right around uh, Josiah, the seventh century, you get this shift away from using these images uh, and I argue in the book that uh, this probably has to do with a desire to centralize worship, to prevent too many people from having access to divine images, from being able to create the divine images themselves. Uh, and this was probably the king and his priesthood trying to kind of um, hoard authority for themselves, saying you're not allowed to do it like this. And and just, just to emphasize what you're saying, is pretty much what Dr. McClellan's saying is there were a bunch of games in town that were using the images and that had temples and different locations and and like they're like monopolizing in a sense to get control and to make everything about what their priests are trying to uh, you know get people to come to the temple get people to come to ours yeah and we've got and you know we're uncovering a, a temple right now that is only about five miles west of Jerusalem in a place called um, Tel Motza. There was a Judahite temple that was destroyed um, around the time of the first temple. Uh, the temple at Arad is another example, destroyed um, right around the time of, uh, well, not destroyed, but decommissioned and covered in about six feet of earth uh, right around the time of, of Hezekiah. And uh, a lot of scholars think uh, Sennacherib came through, destroyed a lot of cult sites. There was kind of a de facto cult centralization. Nobody had a choice. They had to go to Jerusalem. They had to bring their offerings to the temple in Jerusalem. Um, Manasseh, some other kings, seemed to want to try to restore that earlier worship at other temples. And we get to Josiah, and he says, oh, turns out I found the book of the law, and you know what it says? You can only worship here in Jerusalem, mm. and you can only use my priesthood, <laughs> and it can only be my deity. <coughs> So I think there's there's something to the argument that Josiah is trying to structure power in favor of um, uh, the folks under his uh, under his purview. And doesn't the, Finkelstein and Collins both think that? Uh, well, I think Collins has said on record with me that he thought Exodus, uh, the Exodus, was actually formulated because of having to be exiled from the Northern Kingdom. Uh, that there may have been an invention of this kind of uh, not saying there weren't Hyksos or some other analogy you can kind of paint, but that they're kind of painting this narrative about the Northern kingdom having to relocate. And in some way that this story of the Exodus is kind of a seventh century invention in light of the circumstances going on. And of course, going into this single deity, I don't know. I mean, it, I think Finkelstein might think there's something to that too. I'm not sure. I, I think um, Finkelstein would argue that there is some, the, the story of the Exodus in some form uh, pre-existed the destruction of the Northern Kingdom, that it came from the Northern Kingdom in some form along with the Jacob cycle and, and other early patriarchal narratives. But yeah, that it was expanded on and it was the way we have it now was created by mm -hmm. the Southern Kingdom uh, to serve their um, development of their identity as a part of Israel because they were... They were originally two separate kingdoms, and then the northern kingdom fell, 
in the Southern Kingdom seems to have appropriated their history and then rewritten it to make it seem like they were a part of the same group all the time. Um, and, and they want the, um, the accolades and everything. So yeah, there's, there's definitely a degree to which the Southern Kingdom is, is, um, retconning, uh, their, their own past in order to, uh, serve their, their interests in the, in the present. And then we have the destruction of the, uh, the temple in, um, 586, 587 BCE. And this does an odd thing. This means God's house is destroyed. God's divine images, everything are taken away by the enemy. And so you only have a couple of ways you can rationalize that. If you want to maintain faith uh, in the deity that was in that temple, you have to say either the deity was defeated, another deity with their nation came in and defeated our deity, or you have to say we did something wrong and our deity was mad at us. And so abandoned the, their cultic media, abandoned their temple, and allowed it to be destroyed. And so most everybody's going to go with the latter. And this is how they rationalize the, the exile. <clears throat> but then we have a shift in the divine images. Um, instead of being these physical objects that exist in only one form and in one place, we kind of textualize it and then make it a little more abstract. The kavod is one way to do this. The glory, we have the story in Deuteronomy. We have several stories in Deuteronomy and in Ezekiel where the deity's image is not a, um, a standing stone. Now it's this kavod, this shininess, this pillar of fire, this smoke, these kind of amorphous ways that God's presence is symbolized in fire and smoke. And you can't destroy those things. So um, that, in, in some sense, protects the divine image. Uh, and then we also have the textualization. We have the messenger of Adonai, the angel of the Lord, who is an, um, an enigmatic figure. We have a bunch of stories in the early Hebrew Bible where this angel seems to be speaking as the angel in one verse and then as God themselves in the next verse. Right. Um, and this is something that has bothered a lot of people for a long time. We have, uh, I think the earliest story is actually with a woman with Hagar, um, who's out in the desert and, you know, throws her baby under a bush. And then it says it's the angel of the Lord that is talking with her. But then this entity is like, oh, I'm going to, um, you know, make your, your, um, offspring great. And I'm going to do this, that. And then she says, have I really seen Adonai and, and lived? And she named the place, um, uh, the seeing one because of Adonai who spoke with her. And so it seems to confuse their identity. And we have the same thing in Exodus three, Moses sees the burning bush and verse two says, the messenger of Adonai appeared to Moses in the flame of fire in the bush. And the whole rest of the chapter, it's God themselves talking to Moses. And in verse six, they say, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And so there we have this with Gideon. We have this with Manoach and his wife. We have this with Abraham. There are a bunch of places where the angel of the Lord and God's very own pre presence are mixed up. And what I argue is that in all of these stories, you can pluck out the word malach, angel, and they tell perfectly coherent stories about God themselves visiting these folks. And so at some point, a scribe came through and wrote in malach, angel, in a handful of places to muddy the water a little bit about God's presence and to uh, create this figure, this Malach Adonai, who becomes kind of a textual representative uh, divine image who can be both the deity and not the deity, just like a divine image. Uh, and then later in um, Exodus 23, you have an accounting of how that is, that the messenger can claim to be God and can do what God does. Uh, says, uh, I'm sending a messenger before you. We'll guide you on the way. Uh, don't rebel against him. He doesn't have to forgive your sins because my name is in him. 
And this is very similar to the standing stones and the tablets of the law and other things where the divine name is kind of the vehicle for divine agency and power and presence. And so by that endowment with the divine name, the messenger can then speak as the deity. Um, and this, I suggest, is a key to understanding how they understood divine images at the time. And if we look at Deuteronomy, the temple is the place where God's name dwells. And that's how we know that the temple is authorized. That's how we know God's presence is there is because God's name is there. Um, and this leads to uh, the overlap between our traditional divine images, standing stones and things like that. When Moses, um, Moses is commanded to write the words of the law on a standing stone, and then the text says that they um, offered sacrifices before Adonai, which is usually technical terminology for sacrifices in the temple that you would do before a divine image. And so by writing the words of the law on the standing stone, they seem to have endowed the standing stone with God's presence. And we have a similar story with Joshua, who is commanded to write the words of the law on a scroll. And then there's a standing stone set up and then worship is offered um, before Adonai. And I suggest that what we've got here is kind of a an overlap of the old divine imagery, divine image uh, media and the new, which is going to be the words of the law uh, in the exile. We don't have the temple, but we still have some texts and the texts have God's name on them. And so maybe the texts can function to reify, manifest God's presence. And so uh, the argument uh, that I get into is after the exile, you get all these little miniature forms of divine images that contain the words of the law, like a mezuzah, a mezuzah is a little thing that would go outside a door that has some, um, some scrolls with some of the words of the law written on them. So they have the divine name copied on them a bunch of times. And what this would do would miniaturize, mobilize, democratize the divine agency that is evoked, that is manifested by the materialization of the divine name. And it's used in similar ways that standing stones were. Uh, you would have them by the door of your house or by the gate of a city. And so now we've got mezuzot by the door of your house. Um, and there's, uh, there's another image uh, you can pull up, the two little uh, silver scrolls with the inscription on them. So these are what, what are known as the Ketaf Hinnom scrolls. Uh, and they are little silver scrolls that have the priestly uh, blessing uh, from Book of Numbers on them. And they have the divine name on them multiple times. But these were rolled up tight and would have been kept in a little, um, in a little case uh, that someone would have worn on a necklace and they were buried with somebody. And so the argument is that this is a miniaturized version of a divine image. So silver was was one of the substances that was used in divine images a lot because it kind of kept it its luster. It didn't corrode. And so it was thought to be more conducive to divine agency. And so in this way, an individual could have the divine name inscribed on a little piece of silver, roll it up tight, have it bouncing against their chest all day long, reminding them that God's name is there, God's protection is there, and it will ward off evil. So this is what's called an apotropaic amulet. Apotropaic means um, warding off evil, a little amulet that wards off evil. And they were probably buried with it um, because carrying it with them into the afterlife would have warded off the evil of the afterlife as well. And so we've got a bunch of examples um, in the, the main seventh chapter of my book. I go through a bunch of different ways that texts that had the divine name on them or portions of the book of the law seem to have been treated in ways very parallel to the ways divine images were treated uh, in that they manifested the presence of God and they were ways for folks to have material indices, a material index for God's presence and in that sense, the Bible, uh, as it was initially coming together, was probably conceptualized very much as a, a form of divine image. And we don't think of it that way much anymore. But because that is a product of our intuitive cognition, it does not surprise me at all that even today, people treat the Bible 
as if it were divine, as if it were God. We hear people talk all the time about treating the Bible as an idol. And I don't think that's an accident. I think that's a very intuitive way to approach the Bible because it's probably how the Bible came together anciently was as a way to materialize the divine name and have it with you so that you can um, you know, commune with the divine whenever you uh, were able to have that text around you. And yeah, and then I uh, the index that I added to Sorry. the book. Sorry, I'll I'll, I'll do my um, my I had myself spiel. muted. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was like, you know, and I, wasn't oh, thinking, I was just thinking of the Septuagint and saying when they translated it, no wonder they had kind of a miracle story in getting this into Greek and like this is you know important we're putting this together so maybe there is something to what you're saying in that even in the story of the 70 yeah and in the the letter of aristeus they had the story about you know the 70 go off they all do the thing they bring them all together and miracle of miracles every last word is identical and then they have this big party and that's basically this this um you know um they are um <clears throat> Basically saying, yes, this is divinely approved. This, you know, you can't add anything to it. You can't take anything away from it. This is is divine now. And we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls as well, they would copy stuff out and leave gaps where the divine name was. Because you had to have a specialized scribe who would come through and write the divine name um, in the Paleo-Hebrew characters with a number of, of the, the manuscripts. And then you couldn't scratch it out. You couldn't erase it. You had to have what they call deletion dots that you would put under or, or above it. And uh, even today, uh, when you in a synagogue, when they're done with it, when a scroll is, uh, is too worn out, they don't just throw it away. They put it in a Geniza, uh, which is a special storage place. And, and um, famous Jewish folks in, in the past have been buried with Torah scrolls. They've, they are treated very much like, um, like divine images. But... So the basic argument is that the logic of divine images is the very same logic that we see today in the, the treatment of headstones, but also the same logic that we see in the development of the biblical text. And then I take it one step further in an appendix and talk about how this very same logic is the logic of early Christology, how Jesus could be conceptualized as both God and not God is because as the authorized bearer of the divine name, Jesus is basically a walking, talking divine image, um, which is not totally unheard of. A lot of scholars think that Genesis 2, the, with the creation of humanity, that Adam was created very much like a divine image made out of clay. And then they had these ceremonies for divine images, the cleaning of the mouth and the opening of the mouth where the the deity's agency could enter into and inhabit the statue and what does the deity do makes adam out of clay and then breathes the breath of life the spirit of life into um the image's nostrils and they become a living being and so a lot of people see parallels in the creation of humanity and the creation of divine images and, and i argue for parallels in the treatment of christ and the treatment of divine images as well um so yeah, I don't have my whole book memorized. It is a lot more elegant if you read the book instead of just listening to me rattling on for um, for almost an hour now. <laughs> no, this is this is wonderful, and I didn't want to interrupt because there's. I mean, I had a few points I just wanted to throw at you along the way, but yeah. other questions came up. Um, I won't rabbit trail too far. I am interested in examining one quick question. It might be a simple answer. Did Margaret Barker's work in any way first temple ideas of Judaism impact your your understanding of? Of, uh, of early Christianity, or do you not really go down that path? No, I don't really go down that path. And and I, I think that M Margaret Barker has done a lot of uh, work that I think is interesting and provocative, but also very speculative. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of parallelomania um, going on in, in there, not, not to um, pathologize anything, but to get suggest that I, I think there are connections that are perceived and then asserted without going through um, all of the um, scholarly necessaries to, to demonstrate them. And so um, I've, I've read a lot of uh, Margaret Barker's work. I don't think it all stands up to, to scholarly scrutiny. Um, no problem. But, 
and and my appendix is pretty short. I'm I'm addressing um, primarily some some other scholars, Richard Balcom and others, who talk about early Christology. Awesome! I look forward to seeing that too because uh, he seems to be a huge contender for apologist. And it's like, well, I want to hear what some some other scholars have to say. I did want to bring up the other image that I did throw up on the thumbnail that we didn't discuss. Ah. Oh yeah, yeah and yeah. and. Is this like I know when I've talked to other scholars, we could find depictions of L, like in, in depending on the region and where, but like Yahweh is kind of this mysterious deity where it's like, where is the image of Yahweh? Do we have a picture that can help us know that this is what Yahweh was depicted at as by certain groups, maybe within Canaan? Uh, and so is this Yahweh? I know we can't say with certainty, but do you think this is an image of Yahweh and his Asherah? So, so this is from uh, Kuntilad Ajrud from Pithos A, and we've got this drawing of these two figures. Um, I And the inscription up at the top in black, I intentionally drew this so that it would look like the inscription is overlapping the image, because it is on the actual um, Pithos. And so I think it is, because the, the line that is overlapping that headdress says, to Adonai and to his Asherah. Um, or and to Asherah. And so I think these figures, although they are framed with imagery that is traditionally associated with Bess, this Egyptian deity, uh, they're clearly a male and a female figure. Uh, they've got interlocking arms. And so even if they were not originally drawn to represent Adonai and, and Asherah, the inscription that is written over them, I would suggest indicates whoever wrote that inscription interpreted them as such. Got and it. so for the person who made that inscription, they were Adonai and Asherah um, kind of shown through a, um, an iconographic Bess filter. Um, so I do think that's what's going on there. You could see the the <laughs> the difficult phallus there at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. What is that in the top right? Before I before we jump to super chats, um, what's this object in the top right of this? So that seems to be an individual, another female character on a on a chair. Seems to be playing a lyre. Um, and scholars have, have debated that for a long time. We, we've got these two main figures, but then there's one that seems to be in the background, and who is that? And and there have been a bunch of suggestions. I don't think any of them make much sense. Uh, but this this whole this is a large jar, and as you can see, there's writing and there are drawings all over it. You see this weird little beastie um, sticking his head in from the upper left as well. And on the back of that jar, there was a there's another depiction of a um, was probably an almond tree with a couple of ibexes feeding at it, which is a very traditional um, uh, symbol of Asherah. So I think that's another thing that strengthens the identify uh, identification of this image as uh, at least the one on the right is Asherah. But it, it's complex. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wow. This is, is a lot of fun. I really appreciate you taking us through the book. At least we did a uh, airplane view. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a little kind of drunk, um, a little <laughs> woozy, but uh, <laughs> trying to go cover as much of it as possible. I know there's going to be some questions from our audience um, and yeah. I'm going to take some of these super chats. And then when we catch up, I have some questions myself that uh, if, if we catch up, maybe the audience says you're not getting your questions in today. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Crawford Fulton King, good to see you in the chat. We are pirates. No myth vision. Always happy to learn new things. Thank you for the super chat, my friend. Um, Scott Duke, thank you for joining us today. Dr. M, where would you dig to look for inscriptions, writings, or artifacts that deal with early Yahweh worship? What work is going on now in this area? That's that's a great question because I um we we can't really target where we where we hope to find stuff. When we find stuff, it just kind of we happen across stuff. Um the so the image that just uh came up that was discovered back in the 60s uh in the uh northern Sinai Desert. Uh we've also found inscriptions um at Kirbel al Qom. Found a very similar inscription in a tomb that talks about uh, Adonai and his Asherah. The um, Ketaf Hinnom scrolls that I showed, those little silver scrolls, those were found in a burial at uh, Ketaf Hinnom, which is just next to the city of David in Jerusalem. Uh, we tend to find stuff all over. 
Uh, these days, the discussion about the origins of Adonai have moved to the south, to around Midian and deeper into um, the Arab Peninsula. There's a great book um, by Daniel Fleming called Adonai Before Israel, Glimpses of History in a Divine Name, where he talks about the discovery of two Egyptian inscriptions at Solab and at Amara West from the 13th and 14th centuries BCE that seem to reflect the Tetragrammaton, or at least a version of it. And it seems that at that time, it wasn't a divine name. It was the name of a land or of a people. And so um, a lot of scholars think that the divine name developed from this land or this people, and the evidence seems to point to south and Midian or <clears throat> further into the Arabian Peninsula. And then this book by Robert Miller, Adonai, Origin of a Desert God, that argues for Midian, um, but we can't really know for sure just because we don't have a ton of archaeological data. So I think a lot of folks who are interested in the origins of Adonai are hoping that we find more data uh, related to Midianite religion and maybe um, some other nomadic groups, uh, peoples that inhabited um, the uh, Arabian Peninsula a little further inland. Um, but I think there, if you've ever been to Israel, if you've ever been around dig sites, they're exciting places to be. Um, Kirbet Kayafa um, is a, a fascinating place. They've discovered, um, I think, one of the earliest inscriptions that some people think is Hebrew came out of there. And that's right next to, if you go to the Valley of Elah, where David was supposed to have fought Goliath, it's like right over the hill. So um, I was there in 2019 and and uh, didn't even realize how close I was to Kayafa, but I wish I could have gone to, to see it. So I don't know that we could target a place, but there are a lot of places where people hope something turns up uh, in the near future. Although, you know, I, I, tell Motsa. That's the other place that I was going to say. That's this temple that's just five miles west of Jerusalem. They are currently digging there, and they have found um, in the wall of the temple what looks like a um, a standing stone that appears mm. to have the legs of a striding deity figure on it. And so, sorry to interrupt, but that, no. that's one more place. I'm hoping stuff comes out of Tel Motza. I look forward to learning more too, because I, a simple observation that I'm sure you've noticed as somebody who's an academic in the field of academia, who comes into the TikTok world, the popular social media world is one of the things, and I, I hate using this, but I, I'm just pointing out facts. I think there's a serious Dunning-Kruger effect that happens to be all over the world on social media. And the more we talk to legit, hardcore academics who really know what they're doing, the more that you aren't going to get that that satisfaction answer. You're just like, oh, yep, yep, we know exactly. What, yep, blah, 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 blah. They're always tentative. They're always very careful. They're always like, he may have been here, and here's the reason and the evidence. And they're never, usually never, dogmatist. And it's yeah. like, like, I think we – giving this to the medium that we're working in and YouTube should try to create that kind of mentality in people to realize how much we really don't know that kind of humbles us in acting like we have all the answers. You know what I mean? Yeah. Un unfortunately saying, well, it could be a bunch of things doesn't uh, sell. It's not sexy. <laughs> doesn't get a lot of views. So right. um, uh, unfortunately, the uh, the folks who say this is the way it is and it's no other way are the ones who get the most attention. And um, that that's one of the things that frustrates me as someone, as I'm, I'm sure it frustrates you, who tries to combat misinformation. Uh, yeah. It's just that that confidence and that dogmatism is is one of the, the hardest parts of combating misinformation. We should just start titling our shows. I'm right and you're wrong. And then, you know, like people will just, people will come and watch that kind of show. Um, Crawford Fulton King is back again. I still talk to my late fiance. The continuity of the soul is one thing that I can't let go of from my religious days. It's not rational, but I'm human. I don't and, judge it at all. <laughs> yeah, that's that's part of the human experience. And if that makes somebody's experience better for them, more meaningful them for them, uh, richer for them, why mm -hmm. would you give them a hard time about it? Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I say the same thing. I'm one of those people who 
pigeonholes himself by the definition of atheist, meaning I don't really think there are real deities that exist. But at the same time, if someone has no meaning and whatever reason they're nihilistic and they absolutely, the worldview they have isn't working, I encourage they find something that does. And it, obviously something I'd hope is not radical, but nonetheless will give them meaning. You don't hear that enough. I think we need to start practicing saying things like that for people who might need it. In fact, I'm not going to name names. I had a, a piece of mail come in from someone who views myth vision. And um, they said, Derek, like I've sent your channel, I've deconverted from Christianity, but I can't go as far as you can uh, on the whole, when we die, there's nothing else. And uh, it's scary and I don't like it. And it makes me feel like, what's the point? And I'm like, so I wrote her back a letter and and hopefully it'll get to her soon. It's just like, I get it. Hold on to whatever you need to that gives you comfort and purpose and meaning, you know, but you don't have to be a Christian to find that too. I try to tell people. So, yeah. Yeah. I think everybody's, um, you know, it's based on our cumulative experiences and everybody has different um, experiences. But at the same time, if anybody has ever pulled out an old yearbook to look at an old uh, flames picture to kind of gin up that sense of that feeling that you got when they were around, um, you know, that's the same thing. Mm. We're still toying with uh, intuitive uh, perception and experience uh, in an effort to feel something. And um, yeah, that's that's a part of life. Nobody escapes that. Nobody's exempt from uh, from that. And I think it's wrong, if I might say this, and maybe we'll learn this as the years go by, to ben- to monopolize. When we have people run around monopolizing that experience, acting as if this is their worldview in which this experience, this is the human experience. This does not have to be categorized. You do not have to put this under a certain particular ontology or anything. This is human and it's, it's okay. It's totally okay. And I want to push that. I want to get people more acquainted with accepting that. I think it's important because too many people on the internet who hold a certain view, you're borrowing from my world. And it's like, (laughs) we're all human. We're all sharing in this thing. So, Rhett Jet, bin, uh, binging myth vision, loving it, sparked a lot of discussion with don't know how long a day is to God. Apologist mom and free will Baptist dad, keep it up. You have really inspired me to try to do what you do. Wow. Thank you. Good work. Yeah, I'm working. I'm waiting for someone to hit you in the head with a with a bombshell question. Because <laughs> these have been – I've got questions. Don't worry. I promise you That's- I've got See, see, I lull them into, I muddy the waters and then I run away before anybody can figure out what, what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, Robert Herring, thank you for super chatting. My Dreedal, is that dreidel. how you pronounce it? Dreedal, dreidel, dreidel, dreidel. dreidel. I made you out of clay. Also made out of clay, just saying. <laughs> wow. Okay, come on, come on. Get the deep questions out here. Cheryl's here. Thank you for the super <clears> chat. Do you think the idea of Trinity is three separate gods or one God with three facades? Ah, <sighs> so um, I think the Trinity is basically a, excuse me, I'm getting over a cold, so I'm still a little congested. Uh, I think the Trinity is a concept that is self-contradictory that was imposed upon Christianity uh, so that they would stop fighting amongst each other, basically. And that's the the appendix I go through kind of gives an account of, of how the earliest Christians probably conceptualized Jesus as a, a divine agent who was also separate from the deity. And the, the two things that you have to impose upon this before you can even start talking about a trinity is you have to impose this notion that there can only be one God, period, which is a philosophical notion that does not seem to have obtained for anyone who wrote anything that ever made it into the Bible. Because there are gods um, and deities and divine beings, whatever you want to call them, from beginning to end of the Bible. Um, And so this is a philosophical assertion that was not a part of the lived experience of uh, ancient Israel, of early Judaism, of early Christianity. 
But once the philosophers got hold of the gospel and had to make it palatable to the Greco-Roman intelligentsia, they said, okay, we got to figure out a way to make it just one deity, one God. We can't have any more than that. So we have to find a way to get Jesus and God together. And then later somebody said, don't forget the Holy Ghost. So they had to get the third one in there as well. And you had um, a bunch of different ideas about how to make this work. You had early emanation theology, which is similar to what we have in the Gospel of John, which derives from uh, Platonism and Stoicism to some degree. And finally, once the Roman Empire gets a hold of Christianity, you have them basically come in and say, okay, we got to put a lid on this, figure it out. And you have the Council of Nicaea, you have Arianism that has rejected Arianism, the notion that there was a time when Jesus did not exist, that Jesus is subordinate to God. The uh, Nicene Council said, no, there was never a time when Jesus did not get, exist. Uh, Jesus is equal to God. And this is based on other philosophical frameworks that were imposed on this. And so I think once it got to this institutionalized uh, empire level, they said, we can't have these disagreements and misunderstandings. We got to figure out a way to make this work. And so they said, here's what it is. And if it doesn't make sense, that's just part of the mystery and stop bothering us. Um, and, you know, if you dig down into the Trinity, you're going to get to a part where you're like, well, this is nonsensical. This doesn't make sense. And that's where you get to, well, that's just the mystery of the Trinity. So, but this is the way it is. So I think of it more as an institution, <clears throat> excuse me, something imposed by an institution rather than something reasoned from um, the scriptures or the lived experience of early Christians. And if you can't tell, I have a problem with the Trinity. Uh, yeah, yeah, so. yeah, I can tell. Yeah, and there is something interesting to mention because um, with your background, I actually did a video yesterday. Uh, I sent a super chat, a couple super chats into William Lane Craig on capturing Christianity's channel. And I actually was trying to point out because he kept using in this recent debacle that happened with everybody knowing about William Lane Craig talking about, I lowered my epistemic bar when the message of Christianity came in. It was such a good message and stuff like that. Well, at the end of the day, he, um, I, he kept talking about the assurance of salvation through the experience of the Holy Spirit as, as like, as like, this is proof. Like th this was enough for me to just know that this was true. And then everything else was just icing on the cake. And I point out this as a person who was a Christian, I had these same experiences. So I super chatted about Mormons and I said, <laughs> is your experience, um, would you say different than that of a Mormon? And I found a good clip of a Mormon, uh, a couple elders actually talking about the experience that they had and how the Holy Spirit is the teacher and stuff like that. And I incorporated it into it to point out, cause he's like, well, we don't have defeaters. Mormons do. I mean, if you want to use the Trinity, that right there could be a great defeater, honestly, against his position. And the Mormons seem to actually try to get this more accurately, biblically speaking, on what's <laughs> happening in, in ancient times. So I just I just want to throw that out there. Like, do you do you have a thought about that? Do you think Joseph Smith might have been trying to get back to something he noticed? Or not saying he had all the like clearly he didn't see everything, but like, what do you think made him go with this mini gods idea? Um, so that, that's something that arises uh, during a specific period in, in Joseph Smith's life in, in Nauvoo. And, and there are a lot of things going on and I'm, I'm not a, an historian of early Mormon history. Uh, although a friend of mine named Ben Park wrote a wonderful book called the kingdom of Nauvoo. If anyone is interested in that, um, in that period, but that was um, there was a lot of restorationism going on um, in that time period, and there was a lot of pushing back against the status quo because of the Second Great Awakening, and so you did have people who were pushing back against these sacred cows, and the Trinity was one of them. There were a handful of anti-Trinitarian movements at the time, but I do think Joseph Smith went a little further than a lot of others in talk <clears throat> in talking about the head of the gods brought forth the gods and talking about the divine council uh, and talking about um, the corporal reality of deity. Um, he was not the only one who talked about these things, uh, you know, in hushed tones or sometimes uh, out in public in that time period. But I, I think it's one of the only ones that thr has thrived since then. 
um, a lot of the other uh, restorationist, revitalizationist movements from that time period were not long lasting. And um, for whatever reason, uh, Mormonism managed to, uh, to survive and for a long time used that to distinguish itself. And um, a, a term from anthropology might be uh, schismogenesis. You um, latch on to differences to crystallize and harden and make more salient the boundaries between you and another group. You differentiate yourself with these uh, with these small differences. And so Mormonism managed to use a lot of those differences to differentiate itself. Uh, and then into the 20th century, it kind of did an about face and has spent a lot of time recently trying to kind of uh, say, we're not all that different. We're just like you in a lot of ways. So, um, so yeah, there, there are a lot of Mormons who wish we would go back to the old days of, uh, uh, of, highlighting the differences and, uh, you know, condemning Trinitarians and stuff like that. So it, it's a fascinating story and, and I'm not the best one to tell it. There, there are a lot of other folks who, um, who are a lot more expert than me and I don't want to embarrass myself. No. <laughs> I got you. Thank you for that super chat, Cheryl. Aaron Adair, Dr. Adair. Good to see you in the chat. The Bible has old gods get demoted to non divinities. Do we know of examples of this happening in Akkadian Sumerian culture, a reverse divinization? We have not, not really. This was, I, I think this was one of the more unique aspects of this renegotiation of the heavens that took place <clears throat> as a result of Judah having to throw up these boundaries and insulate itself against the cultures that were around it. And it took Josiah's um, cult centralization and then went a few steps further and went into mono Yahwism and towards, you know, our God is the God of all other gods. And then you have in Psalm 82, the de-deification uh, of the deities. And there are a number of texts that, that talk about de-deification. Uh, Mark Smith has a, a paper in a 2011 volume edited by Beata Pongratz Leiston called... Um, reconsidering revolutionary monotheism and the paper is called when gods die and it's not necessarily about de-deification or reverse divinization but it's about killing gods kind of get rid of getting rid of them to some degree how that happens in a lot of these mythologies but i'm sure i would love to look into that more i think that's going to be a big part of some of the research i'm doing in the future but yeah i can't think of examples from um sumero akkadian culture where you have deities who are demoted to um to human status you know in in nana's descent into the into the underworld she's stripped of a lot of the symbols of deity of divinity but then ends up getting them back um, and coming out the other side. Um, so I, I don't, um, I don't subscribe to the whole dying and rising, rising God thing, but something you do have is, is deities who kind of are broken down, but then manage to get most everything restored. But that's a great question, Aaron. I'll, I, uh, that's something I'm going to have to look into more. Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate that. Light Traveler said, and thank you for the 666, did Paul and the earlier Christians believe in a different form of plurality of God versus that of modern Christian concepts? Um, I, I, th I think they did. Um, I think they were all living in a world that was saturated with deities, and I don't see any indication anywhere in the New Testament that we had this huge paradigm shift from, you know what, we're just going to worship our God, and if you'd leave us alone, that would be great, to... You know what? Our God's the only God that that exists. Like that paradigm shift, I don't see anywhere in the New Testament because they're still they're still dealing with you know the the texts of the Hebrew Bible that are talking about gods all over the place. Qumran is talking about gods all over the place. A lot of the literature of the Greco-Roman period, the pseudepigraphic, the um, the apocryphal literature, is talking about other gods all over the place. And then you get into the New Testament with Jesus, who's represented as a deity. There was a great paper that just came out like a month or two ago um, by Paula Fredrickson. And if you'll give me a, just oh, I one. love Paula Fredrickson. I'm supposed to interview her sometime. Yeah, she's she's wonderful. Um, and um, okay, here's the paper. Now I've just got 
Oh, I had Adobe Acrobat shut, so now it's got to open up. It's called, <laughs> it's uh, in HTR, so Harvard Theological Review, Philo, Herod, Paul, and the Many Gods of Ancient Jewish Monotheism. Hmm. And it's basically a discussion about how monotheism is just, um, does not fit this time period. And when we look at the Judaism of Philo, of Herod, and of Paul, we see them just kind of accommodating this world that was just saturated with gods while at the same time saying ours is unique, ours is better, but you know, there's still all the other gods. Uh, and we, mm. we even have that in Paul in uh, Corinthians uh, where he says, uh, you know, there, uh, there are many gods and many lords, but for us, Right. There is one God, which a lot of people take as, as an assertion of ontological exclusivity, but it's not. It's like me saying, hey, you know what? There are a lot of NFL teams. For me, there's the Broncos. That doesn't mean I think the Broncos are the only team that exists. It I was going to say, you have uh, some similarities to John Elway. So, you know, <laughs> I can you know, see funny why. Funny my, dad, my dad looks an awful lot like John Elway. Really? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, um, but and just yeah. something to say, she mentions in her, in one of her lectures about how even Paul's blaming other gods for like the kind of stuff he's going through. He's being, he thinks he's being attacked by other gods, right? This is stuff like these gods are trying to hurt him, but don't worry in the end, these gods will be defeated and uh, Jesus will come or God will destroy these other deities. And that's kind of the promise. She says that he is promising these Gentiles who are coming in that like, our God's going to defeat all of them. So you might yeah. want to get in here before it's and, too late. And she talks about that in the new article as well. But yeah, he, he doesn't deny they exist. He just kind of um, marginalizes them as demons, which doesn't mean not a God. It just means an itty bitty God. You're not as special. You're not as powerful. You're not as big or important. So it's, it's rhetorical. It's, it's not a, a philosophical assertion of monotheism. It's, um, you know, the rhetoric of incomparability, um, just using Greco-Roman um, kind of uh, literary conventions to do it. A couple questions for me. We are out of Super Chats. I'm glad we finally got to this. Um, and it may not take you long to answer, so I just figured I'd ask you. As far <laughs> as I was told or heard through the grapevine over the years, um, the objects inside of the Ark that are described in the Bible – have kind of sexual innuendos to them. They're phallic um, and it almost like uh, kind of like how Francesca talks about the rainbow is kind of a symbol of God's penis, right? Things like that. Um, that, that in the arc, the, this, the rod and, and other things may symbolize uh, the phallus of God, or I, I don't know. I mean, like it's, I've not I can, I I've ever heard of that, but I I haven't seen that argued in a in a scholarly setting. Okay, um, I can see somebody trying to make a connection between uh, the flowering rod as kind of a symbol of fertility, and maybe this is associated with um, some kind of uh, phallic concept of, of fertility deity. But I I would argue that it, it's probably closer to the the goddess concept than it is to uh, to a male uh, concept of of deity. Um, but yeah, I don't think I've ever seen that argued in a, in a scholarly setting, but it does sound like something, um, that would get a lot of attention, uh, on yeah. social media. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's an awful lot of that. And, you know, I, I just responded to a video maybe yesterday. Yeah, I think it was yesterday, but Joe Rogan talking about, um, John Marco Allegro's theory of, uh, mushrooms, uh yeah. yeah, sacred mushroom and the cross. Um, you know, that kind of stuff gets a lot of attention, but, but I think the, the connections are a lot looser than, than, um, people would argue. If someone's interested in hearing a response about some of that, it's not extent, like a very deep, deep, uh, response, but, um, John Collins has a audible book that is about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Cause he's like a head honcho when it comes to the, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, yeah. And he he mentions Allegro and Pass and going through the history of reception and whatnot that we've kind of discovered and mentions that. So uh, um, Matthew Pop drops a super chat. Hey, Dr. M, you mentioned Bez. Did any Egyptian gods get worshipped in Judea? And any thoughts on origin of the burning bush and angels made of wills? 
So, um, yeah, probably were Egyptian gods being worshipped in Judea. If you look at some of the onomastic research, so that would be the publications that look at personal names that are discovered on bullae and inscriptions and things like that. You do have um, a minority of personal names that have the names of Egyptian deities, Hathor and things like that um, in them. And so uh, that would indicate that some people who were living around Judea in uh, in the time period around which the Bible was written were probably acknowledging, if not worshiping Egyptian deities. I think that there was probably pretty widespread worship of, of other deities prior to around the seventh century BCE. And this area uh, was usually under Egyptian hegemony. So it was usually um, a vassal state more or less to Egypt and particularly under like Hezekiah, we have, um, under Hezekiah, famously Hezekiah sought the aid of the Egyptians against um, Assyria, but we have uh, jar handles and Hezekiah's seal that show Egyptian scarabs and the Uraeus um, serpent and things like that on them. So there was very heavy Egyptian influence and definitely they would have known about them. Um, and the book, uh, so Kiel and Ullinger, a couple of scholars uh, did a book called God's Goddesses and Images of God. Um, in 98 or 99. And it is all about the iconography of deity uh, mm -hmm. in this area. And they go into great detail. Uh, and that's like the only place where you can find some iconography that um, has been discovered. Uh, and they talk a lot about the influence of Egypt and the um, iconography, uh, how it uh, is pulled directly from Egypt. And any thoughts on the origin of the burning bush and angels made of wheels? Angels made of wheels. So that comes from Ezekiel. I think that's just, Ezekiel's uh, got a lot of just bizarre imagery that's just supposed to kind of just throw you off a little bit and, and um, make you a little uncomfortable. Uh, and, but it's they're never called angels uh, in that text. Uh, they're... Um, I think they're, you know, you've just got the Ophanim uh, and you have a few different entities, living entities that um, are discussed in Ezekiel that are kind of described as these bizarre figures covered in eyes and things. And, and I think that's just a feature of Ezekiel's uh, writing and the burning bush um, there. No, I don't think I have any, any, uh, strong feelings about where I think that might've come from. Uh, that's kind of a little niche area of research that I uh, haven't gotten deep into. Um, Thank you. But I definitely think that it was originally uh, Adonai, the God of Israel that appeared in the bush and that somebody later came through and, and wrote angel in front of the name. <laughs> Thank you, Matthew, for that super chat. Rhett Jet says, just became patron of Mythfish and do I get wings? Of course. <laughs> See, as soon as you become a patron, you actually become a seraphim. Isn't that the one that has six wings? Something like that. Uh, they cover their body parts in the presence of God, it seems, as uh, Francesca talks about, to the point where they cover their, their private areas. But God's uh, got the biggest junk on the block, if you will. Uh, try not to use the words. <laughs> but I, I am so – you don't even need to make up stuff to advertise for her work. It, you know, in that, in that field, yeah. like you don't have to make up anything to get a lot of attention – yeah, and I got I got one of the UK ver editions of her book. Um, so I don't know how I got it too, but I oh, you got one too. Amazon. Okay. Yeah. Did you get? Uh, but I have uh, an inscription from her in it. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, you because win. I did a bunch of drawings for her book. Did you? Which ones? Yeah. Um, it, oh gosh, there I think there are thirteen or fourteen in here. Um, if you look at the list of illustrations you'll see where she um, uh, she credits me. So they're, they're mainly the, uh, the ink drawings uh, the ink of drawings. artifacts, okay. yeah. Man, I'd love to show one right now just, just to get give you more brownie points than you already have <laughs> right now for having her signature on the book. Um, oh, I got one right here. What page? Oh, page 173. Let's see it. Let me make you full screen here. Hold on, let me make you full screen. Ah, what is that? So this is a um, very poorly preserved uh, fresco of uh, the Assyrian god Asher, which is where the, the name Assyria comes from. 
So they've got the wings. They've got the sun disc behind them. They're drawing a bow. What does she say here? Uh, the deity's blazing radiance emanates from his body. Once brightly covered, colored, the original image appears on an enameled brick from a temple in the city of Asher and is dated to the reign of King Tukulti Ninurta II. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I did. Um, so I did all the drawings in my book. And actually, um, as I finished them, I posted them on Twitter and said, anybody wants to use these drawings or these artifacts, you're free to use them. Uh, as another means of kind of democratizing something that scholars frequently have a rough time finding. Um, or have to pay a, a boatload of money. Yeah. yeah. So well, I was like, I'm just going to draw them. <laughs> and then if you want them, you can have them. And, uh, and Francesca reached out to me and was like, hey, uh, speaking of drawing uh, pictures for books. Save a little money and keep. Yeah. So for <laughs> those who are interested, this book is free on PDF right now in the description. I want people to make this popular. I want to get you more attention that you deserve because I'm impressed as I've been reading this, just getting through the science first before we approach this, which was leading me to another question, but we get some indulgences sent our way. So I have to go with the indulgences to make sure people go to heaven. Where would a person find that image of Adonai and Asherah? Uh, so, um, well, in my book is is my drawing that I did of it, but you can right. find a photo. You can find a variety of photographs of this thing if you um, you have to uh, Google the name of the inscription. It's uh, the Kuntilat Ajrud inscription or drawing. So that would be K U N T I L L E T A J R U D E T A A J R U D. All right. I think I spelled it right. There it is. <laughs> yeah, they've got it in the in the comments. Yeah, that's that or okay. that's you got it in the comments. That yeah. was me. Okay, cool. If you if you Google that and then either drawing or inscription or something like that, you can find the images. And the the reason one of the reasons I drew it was because the photographs that exist are not great. Um they the the it has not deteriorated, but the image is faded a little bit. So it's a little hard to see what you're looking at. Um, wow. Okay. Thank you so much for that. And uh, Michael, thoughts on Matthew making Isaiah seven fourteen into a messianic prophecy? <laughs> um, and, so, and I want to say something just about you that's interesting. Even though you're like specialty PhDs, Old Testament, those who follow you on TikTok, listen to your your shorts and stuff. You do a lot. You cover a lot. <laughs> it's not just that. You you go all over the place. So this probably right is in your. Uh, area where they are using this prophecy in, in Isaiah seven fourteen. If I'm not mistaken, this is about the virgin. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so the Hebrew is Alma, which just means young woman. And, um, in the Hebrew of the verse, it says the, the young woman is with child or has conceived. So that is in the perfect, that is completed action and will bear, um, a son and shall name him Emmanuel. So the prophecy seems to be at a period in time between conception and birth. Um, and when it gets to the uh, Septuagint, the Greek translation, we have, uh, if I recall, I'd have to look to make sure, but it's either in the, the Septuagint or in Matthew's quotation of the Septuagint, it has changed to the future. Um will conceive, will give birth. And what I think that indicates is this is a way that this statement of, of fact is turned into a prophecy in order to renegotiate the significance of the passage. Because by the time of the translation of the Septuagint, the fact that a king was born and all this stuff happened is no longer relevant to anybody. Um, unless you can make it a prophecy about something that's going to happen soon. And this is one of the common ways that people have renegotiated with the Bible is by finding ways to make it meaningful to today by rereading it as something about today instead of about the first century, about the seventh century, right. about the 10th century. Um, and there's a great book if you really want to get deep into this, because um, I I don't have a, a ton more to say about that, except that it's just a Christian rereading of this text in a way to make it relevant and meaningful. Uh, the book, um, and you may have spoken with these authors as well, 
uh, Amy Jill Levine and Marx V. Brettler's book, uh, The Bible With and Without Jesus. Mm -hmm. Have you um, have you looked yeah. at that book? I interviewed so, her on it. OK, I, I figured you you may have. Uh, so that book goes through a number of case studies where they talk about this passage and, and a bunch of others from the Hebrew Bible and talk about this is how Jewish folks understood it. This is how Christians understand it. And they kind of examine the hermeneutic of both groups uh, to show that, uh, you know, reasonable folks can um, can find meaning through both of these hermeneutical lenses. And I think the goal of their book is really to help Jewish folks understand Christian approaches to the Bible mm -hmm. and Christian folks to understand Jewish approaches to the Bible. And I think it's an admirable um, thing that they've done in a wonderful book. So if you're really curious about um, about those kinds of things, I would really recommend that book. That is a great book for that. Thank you for that uh, question. Light Traveler says, would you say that Ezekiel mentioning the Israelite nation came from an Amorite and Hittite is a way of them saying they are Canaanites? Um, <clears throat> I think it's a... Mm, no, because I think they wouldn't have identified Amorites or Hittites as Canaanites because they came from further up north. Um, now, you and, and you have Hosea who identifies Jacob kind of pejoratively as a wandering Aramean, which is uh, Aramans may be related to um, Amorites. And so it's a way of dismissing him as, as someone from, uh, from this group up north. I think I haven't looked a ton into, um, into Ezekiel's ethnocentrism, but um, I don't think that's a way to say they're Canaanites because they, they generally distinguish the folks from further up north right. from the folks uh, in Canaan. All right. My, my question now, I'm going to slip it in and then this is it. We're going to wrap it up because I can't keep you too long. I want you to be able to come back and we can dive <laughs> deeper into examples in your book. Um, yeah. That was my hope is to get into pericope. We can even bring up the examples and stuff and like really do a deeper dive if we want. Um, you're a student or were a student, if I will, of Francesca Stavrakopoulos. So like for those who are watching, they loved her. Her work got an anatomy we love. However, it's not doing what yours is doing. And I had questions after I read the book and interviewed her twice on this topic. She talked about the gods, you know, there was animal sacrifice and human sacrifice in her earlier dissertation where she's talking uh -huh. about how there seems to be fossils of human sacrifice in the Bible. Um, but I thought, how do the gods eat when you're burning up the food? And when I think of a body, I think of like what we have, right? So like I'm thinking physical. You talk about non-physical things, corporeal and incorporeal. In what way does your work help us understand God having a body? Um. Yeah, I don't. I don't talk a ton about the corporeality of of God. Uh, that's definitely something Francesca does in in her book. But uh, I think the first thing is that uh, a lot of the uh, the ideas about what happens to a sacrifice when it gets burnt is you know they're seeing this uh, this corpse is disintegrating and seems to be just traveling up. And so there's this kind of intuitive notion, something seems to be consuming it as it, as it rises. And so that can be intuitively connected with uh, the notion that, uh, you know, the whole purpose of sacrificing is to nourish the gods, give them something that they otherwise either can't or don't want to get on their own, uh, which is, uh, I argue, is, is related to their treatment of the deceased. But intuitively, they're going to associate overwhelmingly in ancient Southwest Asia, deities are anthropomorphic because uh, they're conceptualized as, as um, entities that are most relevant to us, concerned about our sociality, our well-being, our behavior, Humans are the the entities that are are most concerned about that and that are most important to us. So when they're imagined and when they're discussed, they're going to be overwhelmingly anthropomorphized and treated as um, uh, as human shaped. And when they talk about their sociality, they're usually going to project some kind of existence somewhere, 
whether it is, uh, you know, in the Ugaritic literature, it's Mount Saphon or it's uh, the sea or it's somewhere, somewhere where we are not. That is where the gods have their palaces. That's where they're located. That's where they eat, sleep, drink and um, do whatever. And in the Hebrew Bible, this seems to be the, the lands to the south. We get this idea of Adonai comes forth from Sinai or from Seir or from Midian or from Edom. And these are all lands to the south. And so it's kind of a fortress of solitude concept. Uh, there's this place off to the south. Nobody really hangs out there. That's where God comes from. That's probably where they dwell. And so they have to imagine what, uh, what the gods are like in these places. And overwhelmingly, they're going to be anthropomorphic. And so just like... Go ahead. Oh, I was just say, I'm thinking of like unfalsifiability, and I'm not meaning it in just a like a criticism, even right, though right. we do this with Christians often. But to me, it seems like it, it's like natural to say where we don't know or where we aren't usually is where we can fit in the God of the gaps kind of stuff. Yeah. And and that's and so because we don't have the deity available for inspection and for interrogation. It's really our imagination and the strictures of tradition or of, um, you know, whatever circumstances we find ourselves in that um, restrains how we conceptualize the deity. And so anciently, you know, you had this idea of uh, heaven is God's throne and the earth is God's footstool <clears throat> uh, toward the end of Isaiah. And, you know, they... Uh, this is very similar to some descriptions of gigantic gods that we find in Ugaritic and um, other literature, in Akkadian literature. And so they were imagining how these folks were, um, what they looked like, <coughs> their sociality, their corporeality. And yeah, they could not verify or falsify any of it. So whatever got the job done rhetorically, was generally what stuck. And so you didn't have anybody who could say, no, no, it's not like that. You just had stories that didn't work as well or stories right. that got rejected or lost. And then you had the stories that stuck around and that did the job and they became kind of the um, conventional wisdom about God's corporeality. Last right. one. I I, yeah. I I hate bringing you so long and, and like, but I, I I can't get enough of what you're saying. I'm loving this, and I hope the audience is as well. Um, my final one, as you took us through the funerary practices, and like, I love this book. I just started called "Coming Back to Life," where it inspects like through ancient Greece and how there's this like porous barrier, like you talk about when when they die, when your loved ones die. There's you can't let go. It's not like you just turn off the switch. There's something that is gradual. And so um, I wondered, I'm doing something, I'm just throwing this at you. You've probably heard this before, but I know it's not an academic held position. But if we take this idea of the dead and they continue and be kind of, in a sense, either become immortal in some way or very long lived uh, in their postmortem situation, there's euhemerism that people talk about. And I've had someone mention this years ago saying, what if Yahweh was a king somewhere or some warrior of a tribe who is deified post-death or in some way became the king of kings? And in some way, there's like, he actually was a person at one point. What are the odds of that being the case to you? Um, I actually addressed that in the book. Um, you'll you'll I get to got that. There. Yeah, yeah, I got there. Yeah, you'll you'll get okay. to it. Um, ultimately, my dissertation went uh, into a little more detail, and they were like, "Whoa, there, cowboy!" Um, they they thought this was a little speculative, mm -hmm. but what I mentioned is that one of the theories within the cognitive science of religion is that the deities that survive the longest, become the most important, are what they called morally concerned deities concerned with behavior. And I didn't like the whole moral idea. So I go with socially concerned deities. And I argue that there's so much overlap between the deceased and deities. Like when you look at a mortuary chapel, you've got that Katamua stele. You've got him sitting on a throne. In burials, you have lamps that are provided. You have food that is provided. Um, what do you have in a temple? You have 
the the deity's throne. You have the lampstand. You have the showbread that is provided. You have a standing stone. The temple parallels the grave in so many ways uh, that I argue we need to look at deities being elaborations on significant deceased figures. And so I argue that um, if we take the socially concerned deity framework, who is going to be more concerned for the sociality, the behavior, the well-being of a society than a member of that society who passed away? Um, and, you know, the deceased are referred to as Elohim in the Bible, um, the deceased right. Samuel. Uh, there have been a number of scholars who have pointed out that um, the dead were worshipped, the dead were divine, the dead were gods. Uh, I was thinking of the pyramids. People, common people think that the pyramids aren't these tombs uh, of the gods, of the pharaohs. And it's like, hmm, is there <laughs> something going on here? I don't know. Yeah. And and so the, uh, let's see, I think in the second chapter two, I talk a bit more about this, about the overlap of the deceased and the divine. And so I make the case that uh, one of the reasons we don't have Adonai in any other pantheon anywhere in ancient Southwest Asia at all is probably because it was a lower level deity, probably an ancestral deity. And in, um, in this book, Fleming makes the case that um, so Adonai before Israel. I'm going to have to get that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fleming makes the case that the divine name was probably a personal name and was um, extended over a social group or over a land. And then, um, you know, there's still a lot of research. I'm not saying this was my conclusion, but I would like to look into um, you know, it's common for a personal name, someone who is significant within a society to have their name uh, extended over the social group. The name Israel was a personal name that was then extended over the social group. And, um, and who's to say that that did not then become the deity that was taken um, into the hill country. And so I think there's something to that. I think I would like to look more into that. Um, I don't think that's incredibly unlikely. I just butchered it with a massive link on on the the comment section i, I, I i'm gonna have to get this book you're really blowing my mind i really enjoy this i mean <laughs> it's kind of a funny thing to me and i i love learning the history but with people who are so dogmatic on the internet what if we found out your god was once just a man and then again would it be that different you have a jesus that was just a man who became a God. Like, like, would it be that different for those who are dogmatic Christians to think maybe <laughs> Yahweh was just a man who became a God? <laughs> just to, just to needle some folks. I know. You're getting back to, you're getting back to things Joseph Smith said. So, right. Right. I'm not saying anything else. other than that. Yeah, play the fifth, play the fifth. <laughs> Hey, Dr. Josh, uh, I think, uh, if not the better half, Megan, I'm not jabbing at you, Josh. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Digital Hammurabi, you can't trust this guy. He's friends with people like Joshua Bowen and Kip Davis, faux scholars. Well, I mean, friends. Um, uh, no, actually, yeah. We're, <laughs> um, I've never met Josh in person, but um, Kip and I actually go way back. Uh, we were both at Trinity Western University together um, a decade ago. So um, I've known him for quite a while. Um, and he's, uh, he's good people, even if he is Canadian. He knows all about it. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's just how he is. Yeah. Look, Dr. Josh is not as scary as you think he is. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> um, and he's taller than you think he is too, by the way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Here that, he that was, I'm, I'm shorter than people think I am. Uh, <laughs> when I, when I first showed up at Trinity, so I'm 5'11". When I first showed up at Trinity Western University, um, Marty Abeg, you know, Marty Abeg? No. Um, so he, uh, big Dead Sea Scrolls guy, if you go find an English translation of the scrolls, uh, Marty Abeg is probably involved. Um, he's retired now, big scrolls guy. And we'd been communicating over email for a long time. And when I finally met him, he's like, I'm so relieved. I thought you were going to be like this six foot four Adonis. And I was like, thank you. Um, but he was like, I, uh, the way I read your emails and the way you come across in your emails, <laughs> you just seem like this, like supremely confident, top of the world, control everything guy. And I was like, okay, well, that, I feel a little better about that than, 
Um, but yeah, people frequently tell me I'm shorter than they um, thought I would be. Well, maybe we'll meet in person at some point and maybe we can do some courses together. I'd love to yeah, do that. Maybe. I would love that. So just to show you the book he just mentioned, Yahweh Before Israel, I can't wait to get it. Is this author still alive? Oh yeah, Daniel Fleming is. This book's from uh, uh, 2021. I can't wait. Ooh, so maybe we can get him on Myth, Myth Vision. Um, and if I don't know how to get a hold of him, I know some people who might know how to get a hold of him. <laughs> hint, hint. Yeah, I I'm, uh, I'm actually reviewed this book. I reviewed this book. I reviewed um, that other book from uh, Robert Miller that I showed you. And this then, one? Or you didn't review this one, did you? No, no. Um, this one. You're frozen. Hold on one second. Oh, there you are. Now, I need to get that one, right? What is um, that? Eh, I, I wasn't as impressed with this one, but if you want to see what discussions are going on, Okay. Um, yeah, and then um, Ted Lewis's book, The Origin and Character of God. Um, I review all three of them as part of a review article for the Journal of the American Academy of Religion that should be coming out hopefully within the next month. I've got to buy some more books. Um, <laughs> they're not. Serious. They're not cheap books. <laughs> no, I know. And they're, what I need to do is probably contact the academic press, especially in light of the fact that I'm, I'm promoting a lot of this work. Um, get the book; it's free. His book is down in the description. Again, if you need a hardback to hit somebody with or a paperback in case it gets too cold and you need to burn something in the fireplace after reading it, <laughs> after reading it, I'm going to test you. Uh, get get it on Amazon. Um, just so you know, it doesn't help uh, Dr. McClellan in any way financially to get the book here. So if you're interested, you really want to get your head wrapped around it, get the free PDF. It's down in the description. Also, um, he is on Twitter. So make sure you go follow him on Twitter. If you even do Twitter, it's extremely toxic. I keep hitting the bell and then it keeps unchecking. I don't know why. I don't know. Anyway, TikTok, you got quite a following there. 212,000 followers on TikTok, uh, over four and a half million likes. Also, you're on Instagram. You're doing you're doing better than a lot of the young kids out here. <laughs> so please go show him some love. Follow him. Get his books. Join our Patreon if you want wings like a seraphim or if you want your uh, your family members to move on out of, uh, what is it, purgatory. That's right. Uh, we have indulgences for you. And uh, I just dropped a course with Dr. Litwa, Ancient Greek Mysteries. Also, I have many courses in the description that I've done with Bart Ehrman in the past. So I hope that you check those out. I don't even know what I was bringing this up. Oh, that's right. I have a membership program and I'm dropping stuff for those who are members. Seems like there's like a 50% off. YouTube's demanding that to be the first two things on the membership thing on YouTube. You also get like a special symbol and can use emojis that no one else can if you're a member of the program, which shows you're elite. And all the peasants are beneath you in the, in the comment section. Who doesn't want to have that? So any final words from you, Dan, that our audience might need to hear? I don't think so. I think they've probably heard too much from me. Um, I and not all of it very organized thinking. But um, yeah, I, I appreciate the, uh, the time and the opportunity to uh, yell on the internet for a while. And I uh, appreciate some great questions from uh, from the audience. And uh, yeah, I had a great time. I, I look forward to coming back. Thank you. I hope that you check out his book. Um, all the above, go back, re-examine what he said, and let us know what you think. Never forget, we are MythVision. Vision.